we're going to have the first lady of the tree of life come and take us to the throne of grace, Lady Tiffany Keith. And then we will have another selection from the voices of Pentecost in Jesus' name. place God Lord we submit our hearts and our minds to you on this morning Heavenly Father Lord Lord first we lay down our burdens our cares our sins God we ask for forgiveness God and we lay them at your feet God Lord we thank you for today God for tomorrow is not promised hallelujah Lord Lord we thank you for your blessings God for the miracles that you have wrought before our eyes hallelujah Lord Lord to encourage us God Lord that things can be brought to you in prayer God and you can show up and show out hallelujah Lord Lord you have encouraged us with our sister in our midst on this morning hallelujah Lord Lord we thank you for healing God we thank you for restoration God we thank you for the miracle that she is hallelujah Lord oh God all those under the sound of our voice God Lord we are encouraged God oh God we see the faith that was fought God the faith in the prayer that was given God and we too God can be victorious God oh God you say to lay down our cares before you for you care for us God and that we pick up the right spirit and faith and in hope and in trust God Lord that would guard our hearts and our minds against those things that rob us God Lord we claim them back God all of the blessings God oh God all of the freedom that you've given us in your spirit God we claim those things our families our loved ones our children our community God we claim them back in the name of Jesus hallelujah Lord our grandchildren hallelujah our mothers our fathers our sisters our brothers God we call it as done in the name of Jesus God oh God you said speak it God hallelujah Lord oh God we speak it on this morning in faith and in trust God that you're gonna move on our behalf God Lord that we're gonna get out the boat and walk towards you in faith God not looking down God not looking around God but holding our eyes on you God anything that comes up against us God we bind it in the name of Jesus God all of the attacks of the enemy are under our feet in the name of Jesus on this morning God we claim victory God everything that Satan has set out against us we say it is annoyed how is void God we cast it back never to return again God we speak these things in faith God Lord bless the service on this morning get the glory bless your man servant let him speak a word Lord not be deterred not be hindered God but stand flat footed and bless your people God in the name of Jesus bless our shepherd in the name of Jesus from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet God everywhere he walks God every shadow that he casts God be in the midst God we speak it right now Lord for our mother God you know what you need to do in the name of Jesus God but we stand together 
together believing in the name of Jesus Lord we pray this prayer together on this morning believing it and receiving it in the name of Jesus I pray amen and amen selection from the voices of praise and then the next speaking voice you will hear will be that of our friend and brother Pastor Tim Run keeps singing Tree of Life Ministry that will be in Praise the Lord everybody Praise the Lord everybody Let's give a little hand praise just for being in the midst of it I am super excited because on March 29th and March 30th, everyone say Good Friday. Good, good Friday. Friday. Everyone, one more time, say Good Friday. Good, good Friday. Friday. Good Friday. This year, we are doing a production right here at Refuge in Kentucky Church. For those of you that are watching us virtually, you can see it right there on the screen. But we are doing The Passion of the Christ. Amen? Amen. It is featuring many of our members of our sanctuary right here, members of Tree of Life, members of Feasts of God, and you're so excited that we're being able to put on this production. Now, it is free of charge. Everyone say free. Free. How much do you have to pay to get in? Absolutely nothing, because we do not think uh, that this message should be restricted to those who can pay for it. To have money to go to Actors Theater is great. To have money to go to the Louisville Orchestra is great. But we're here, right here at Refuge in Kentucky Church, we're in the business of trying to reach souls, reaching the lost at any cost, right here in the heart of the city, where the people of the city are in, in our hearts. So, Right here on Good Friday and the following Saturday, March 29th and March 30th, we are putting on the Passion of the Christ. Now, I'm going to ask um, our ushers, if you can, get those flyers that I put in the back. And I want each person to take as many as three. I'm going to say three. Three. One for you and one for at least one or two other people. I want you to share this with people. I want people to come. We'll have enough to fill approximately 200 seats, so we want to fill up this auditorium. Amen? Amen. We don't want to have empty seats. It's going to be a powerful word. We're going to have a wonderful time. Terrific singing, terrific ministry. You're going to hear the word in a lived out action form. We don't want people to miss this simply because they do not know. How can people know the word unless someone is sent out to preach to them? And so we're going to do our way and our best to preach this message in a way that is relevant and is real and something that people can grab onto. So take three on Good Friday. We're looking forward to seeing everyone here. I'm going to be back here next week. For those of you on one call, you're going to start seeing some one calls coming up about it. Start telling people. Amen? Amen. Let's get the choir going. Thank you. Amen.
Bless God. Man, I am so excited to be among those who are sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Glory to God. And I'm tired of allowing other folk to define me. Praise God, I'm not what I want to be. But I'm not what I used to be. 
and I'm pressing on the upward way. Uh, new heights I'm gaining every day. Uh, still praying as I onward bound. Glory to God. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Amen. I bless God to join you who are sanctified. Amen. I'm excited. This uh, weekend has been a, a weekend of, amen, excitement and anticipation for me. Praise God. I've taken my first trip in a while. Praise God. I went to my Wisconsin, Illinois, Missouri diocese meeting. Amen. Met with my pastors and praise God. Others that um, we are looking to reshape uh, our outreach. Praise God. And I know the devil thought because of COVID that, amen, we would lose uh, ministry. But I'm excited, praise God, to press forward. Amen. And to make some changes right here at home. Praise God. Uh, God has been good. Praise God. And uh, things are changing around. We're going to uh, do our Bible study in house. Amen. Again, every Tuesday. And those of you who are in the area are certainly welcome to come. Praise God, or you can wait for the rerun on Wednesday. Amen. amen. Praise God, but I like it hot. I like, amen, to be first partaker. Amen, and I bless God for what he's doing. Amen. I am excited. I've got a great bishop in Bishop Barkley Bailey Sr., Praise God. He's got a group of district elders that each have been assigned, amen, a territory. And I'm planning to, amen, load up a bus and go back to Missouri. Amen. Uh, and before we go to Missouri, we're going to go to Tennessee. That's my next uh, venture. Praise God, and I'm looking for God to meet us and to bless us. Praise God. Um, uh, this morning, praise God, I am honored. Uh, on, uh, uh, over the weekend, uh, my other son went with me. Amen. We had a, a tremendous time, uh, great meetings. Souls were baptized. Praise God. Uh, we're looking for souls to be filled and we're believing God that, amen, uh, prayer here is going to bring miracles there. Amen. Yeah. amen. Come on. Praise God. And so uh, we're going to uh, start it out this Friday, this Friday night. Praise God with uh, a special prayer before, amen, uh, our Friday night worship. We're going to start at 6.30. Praise God, and I hope that you will be on time for that. Amen. I am sick of uh, saints putting God last and wanting him to be first. Y'all ain't going to help me. Praise God. We do everything else on time and with fervor. And when it comes to God, we, amen, see if we can find time. 
Praise God. And I'm just believing that if we put him first, praise God, he will bless us in ways, amen, that we have not been blessed before. Praise God. Um, I'm excited, praise God, to have uh, the pastor, Tree of Life, here with us today. Praise God. Uh, he has blessed us in the uh, Bible study. Amen. Uh, getting our house in order. Praise God. Is anybody working on their own house? Y'all got quiet on that one. Is anybody really working on your own house? Amen. Praise God. Which means you're going to stay out of mine. Lord help us. Lord help us. Glory to God. I bless God for who he is and what he's doing. Amen. We are uh, really truly uh, blessed. Got some tremendous ideas and the Harvest truly is right, but the laborers are few, and we hope that we will weed out the ones that are not real in prayer, and then those that are real will go to work. Praise God. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. Praise God. As we prepare our hearts to receive the man of God, every time I walked into the sanctuary over this weekend, they had folks stand like the president had shown up. Y'all ain't going to help me. Praise God. Um, we need to start valuing the things of God. And when we value the things of God, we show that we value them. Praise God. And I promise you, if you value God, He will work in your behalf. And I know things don't always look good because we don't always understand what God is doing, but God's got a plan beyond our comprehension. Praise God. Amen. The old folk, they didn't go to college, but they understood God. Praise God. And they said, and I quote, while you trying to figure it out, God has already. Uh, my mic ain't working. Uh, praise God. If my daughter was here, she said that right there. Glory to God. Come on, tell your neighbor. Say, neighbor, that right there. That right there. While you trying to figure it out. I know it don't look like it's working. Hallelujah. It don't look like things are flowing like they should. But while you are trying to figure it out, God have already worked it out. So don't wait till the battle is over. Praise God. Don't look to see where that's going to happen. Shout now. Praise God now. Rejoice now. Hey, hey, hey. Glory to God. Lord, we bless you. Lord, we bless you. We magnify you. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. Search our hearts. Search our minds. Oh God, we want to bless you. We want to serve you. If there's anything that's not like you, take it out. Take it out. Take it out. We want to be right. We want to be saved. We want to be who you want us to be. Oh God, bless us. Help us to understand that your blessings, your favor, looks good on us 
Ah, glory to God. And if they haven't seen it yet, uh, glory to God, we understand uh, that you're moving, that you're working. And so we praise you now. Amen. Bless your servant as he gives us the word. Help us to get our houses where you want them to be. Glory to God. And help us to stop worrying about how others see us and to appreciate how you see us and how you know us how you move for us and with us we give you honor we give you praise and we bless you for being you have your way in this worship and we will magnify your name Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. And amen. Praise God. Just for a moment, Zion is calling. Praise God. For a higher praise. Standing on the mountain. Praise God. And I need you to come on the mountain with me. Glory to God so that we can magnify his name. Praise God. I know you've been through hell and you've had your struggles. Ah, glory to God. But he didn't bring you this far. Praise God. Not to bless you. Not to lift you. Not to anoint you. Get the glory. Hallelujah. A higher place of praise to stand on the mountain and to magnify his name to tell all the people in every nation Zion is calling, is calling me to a higher place. Everybody says I calling me to a higher place to stand on the mountain. Magnify to tell all the people, yeah, and every nation that signs calling. Come on, just one more time. Zion said, calling me to a higher place. Stand on the mountain. Yeah, yeah. Magnify to tell all the people. And every nation help me say Zion calling me help me say Zion calling me one more time say Zion calling me to a higher place come on let's go right there Come on, let's go right there. Hallelujah. Praise God for the miracle in your home. For the blessing on your job. For the reaching of your kid. Hallelujah. Come on, let's go there. Zion is calling for a higher
you've been good, you've been faithful, you've been kind. Hallelujah. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy. You're worthy. We say thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. And your mercy. And your mercy, Lord, and your mercy. We thank you. And we praise you. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And if you're victorious, lift your voice and say, Hallelujah. 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 Thank you. God, I praise you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Man, uh, truth be told, I'm still stuck on it. Any man being Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. And behold, the Lord is making things new even right now. Hallelujah. God, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your hand of power. <laughs> for your mighty acts and for your excellent greatness. We give you glory. Have your way in our midst. In Jesus' name. God's people said amen. 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 You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. We serve an awesome God. <laughs> God is an awesome God. And he's greatly to be praised. The choir told us from the rising of the sun until the setting of the same. Our God is worthy to be praised. Amen. We salute amen, our pastor. Amen. Pastor Raymond J. Keith Jr. Amen. Amen. For the real time work that we see the Lord doing in his life and body. Amen. Amen. Continuing to give strength. Amen. We thank God for our first lady. Amen. Mother Joan Keith in her absence. We are grateful for what the Lord is doing in her life and body. Amen. Amen. I just have to tell you the truth. I am just, um, I am just um, overjoyed, yeah. amen, to see uh, uh, Sister Van Leer in our amen. midst, Missionary amen. Van Leer. Amen. 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 There are many people who don't come back from what she experienced. Jesus. Hallelujah. God, I praise you. Hallelujah. But we serve a faithful God. He's an on-time God. And he shows up always at the right time. Hallelujah. I mean, I don't want to get used to God's, his, his uh, his, his handiwork. I want to be in awe of God's work all the time. Amen. Amen. And so I give God glory. Amen. For what he has done in our midst. Amen. For those of you that have your Bibles, would you get them and turn with me to um, the Gospel of John, uh, the third chapter. And then we're going to begin our reading in uh, at the 14th verse. Third chapter of the Gospel of John. We'll begin our reading at verse number 14. Amen. It is so good to see uh, so many of you on this morning. Amen. And I'm grateful for your testimony that you are yet holding on. And I'm going to read verses number uh, 14 through 19 in or from the uh, New King James Version. And then I'm going to pick up in verse number 20 from the New Living Translation. Uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to try to switch and follow up. I just want to give you a heads up of where it is that I'm going to go uh, in the reading of Scripture on this morning. Is that all right? Amen. Yes, sir. Third chapter of John's Gospel, beginning the reading at verse number 14. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent... In the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right, they come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Amen. May the Lord continue to bless his word that we would live and grow there by it Amen. as we continue to look to the hills from which cometh our help. Amen. I want to, if the Lord would be my help, I want to minister to you for these next few moments from the subject. It may not make sense, but let God be God. It may not make sense, but let God be God. Would you just look at your neighbor and give them a smile on this morning and encourage them and, and say to them, neighbor. neighbor. Oh, come on. You, you could talk a little louder than that. Say, neighbor. neighbor. It, may make sense, it may not make sense, but let God, let God. be God. In other words, stop fighting God. Amen. I hope that you will pray with me. Uh, a few weeks ago, I, was, I, I began reading a book by um, a pastor by the name of um, Pastor John Bever. And he wrote a book entitled, The Bait of Satan. I don't know if you've ever heard of the book. It's, a, it's, it's not a new book. They put out a new rendition, but it's been out for a while entitled The Bait of Satan. And in this book, Pastor Bever deals with what he calls the deadly trap of offense. Yes. And one of the things that Pastor Bever does early in this book, and I'm still working through the book, I haven't, I haven't finished, uh, but it's, it's been ministering to me um, and, and, and the Lord has just inspired me to, to share with you a bit of how the Lord has been speaking to me through this book. And, and one of the things that Pastor Bevers does early in the book is that he likens offense to bait on a mousetrap. And he suggests that just like a mouse, we are always being drawn to the notion of being offended. Just like a mouse being drawn to bait on a trap, he suggests that there is a natural tendency for us to be drawn to the idea of being offended. Now I need you to be praying with me uh, because I know some of y'all are trying to figure out now how does offense emerge from the scripture that we read. We will get there. But there is, if you would just be honest with yourself, it, it's not really hard for someone to do something that offends you. Y'all don't want to be truthful in here this morning. It, it's not hard for someone to do something and you take offense at what it was that they said and or did or did not do that you thought they should have done. And when you take offense, 
and become offended by what someone else has done, you have been baited by the trap. Now think of the mouse on the trap. Once you get stuck, you're stuck unless a savior comes to redeem you. And if the truth be told, there are many of us that are sitting in this place today and are under the sound of my voice that are sitting in a fence even right now. Some of us were offended by something that was said earlier in the worship. Some of us were offended because um, the choir didn't sing the song that we wanted them to sing or, or they didn't sing the song the way we wanted them to sing it. Some of us are offended by how we were greeted or not greeted this morning when we came to the house of the Lord. Some of us uh, have been offended by our spouses. Somebody say, help, Lord. Y'all don't want to be, they, they don't want to be honest this morning, Pastor. Some of us have been offended by our mother and or our father. Something that they didn't do that we felt like they should have done. And had they done it, it would have saved us some heartache along the way. And what's interesting about the bait of offense is that once you are on the trap, Unless someone comes and gets you off of it, you sit in your offense. What I've, what I've learned is, is offense has the ability to change your psychology, the way you think and the way you see the world. It's, offense is almost like a pair of shades. It, it causes there to be a tint so that you can't see things for actually the color that they are. And so you start speaking and, and doing things based on the offense lens that you are seeing life through. Rather than being able to see clearly. Somebody say, Lord, deliver me from offense. Some of us have been offended by how someone was dressed when they came to church. Maybe not at church, just maybe just dressed in general. Truth be told, I, there are a lot of people that offend me by the way they dress. I find it offensive, and this is just me personally, and I don't want anyone to look this way when I say it. I do find it offensive when women walk around with their breasts hanging out. Because it, it, it forces me to have to make choices about what I'm going to look at. Which, you know, I mean, there are choices in life, right? That's what that's... That's not the that's that's really not the the issue, right? But the but the idea that is most offensive is that if I don't look the right way, I may leave them thinking that I'm looking at their breast, even if I wasn't. And so now I may have been painted into a corner that I should not have to have been painted into to begin with. But the reality is that I had to get over that offense. Because fashion is what it is. Right? And people will be what they will be and they will do what they will do. Man, and the best that we can hope is that as the Lord matures us and grows us in Him, that He helps us to make wise choices, not only in how we dress, but how we talk and how we love one another. Some people are Offended by church. Just church in general. Why we got to go to church all the time? I mean, we, we went on Sunday and Tuesday. Do we really have to go on Friday? Oh, it's, it's quiet up in here. All right. I, I, I hear you, Lord. There are so many things that we can get stuck 
on the trap of offense too. And we don't recognize that it has altered the way we are experiencing and viewing life. Pastor John Bever says that just like a mouse, we're always being drawn to the notion of being offended. And I, and I, I guess I should take a moment before we push, and I'm going to try to push, and note that there is a difference between offense and being offended. Right? Because there are people who have a malicious motive, right? And ill intent. Right? And when they do something to me or against me, it is appropriate for me to acknowledge the offense that they have caused. When you do something to offend someone, you have committed an offense. But there's a difference between an offense and being offended. And the difference is that when someone commits offense and you now become offended, you've allowed what they've done to now alter your mind, your life, and your way of thinking. There are people who have done stuff to me on more times than I care to count. But I thank God that in many cases, not all, I'm still a work in process, praise the Lord. But in, but in many cases... God has given me this gift or the ability to not remember. So that even if an uh, offense was committed against me, I can move on and not be stuck at the place of offense. So that I am free from being offended. And am free to walk in the freedom that Christ has given me. <laughs> There's a lot that I could say about that, but I won't. But it is the idea of recognizing that we all will encounter offense on a daily basis. It will happen many times out of the course of the day. But just because you experience offense does not mean that you have to be offended. Just like the mouse has a choice. He has a choice. Am I going to take the bait of this cheese that's on this trap? Or am I going to keep on going about my business until I get to the meal that I know has been prepared for me. And if we were to be honest on this morning, many of us along the way have taken the bait. And then we wonder, how did I get stuck here? Which is why I'm so grateful for Jesus, right? If, if any man be in Christ, even though I may have been stuck, I can become a new creation. Such that things that used to offend me, they don't have to offend me anymore. Now, I need to, I need to come back to the text because we got to get out of here. We, we, we read from... The third chapter of John, beginning at verse number 14. And we didn't start from the beginning, but this is a conversation that Jesus is having with a brother by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a, um, a Pharisee and a, uh, a, an important figure within the Jewish leadership structure. And most of us are familiar with the, the encounter that Jesus has with Nicodemus because it starts just a few verses earlier in the first verse of the third chapter of John. And I'm going to read it because its context is important. But I need you to understand that even before Jesus enters into this conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus knew what he was dealing with. It starts in John, the second chapter, 
beginning at verse number 23. In John chapter number 2, Jesus had just stepped out into public ministry. And he performed a miracle at a wedding in a town called Cana. Right, and it says that Jesus, he turned um, some, some buckets, some bales of water into wine so that there was sufficient need to meet the demand of the wedding party. After that, the scene turns and Jesus goes into the temple because the Passover was approaching. But when Jesus arrives at the temple, he sees that the people of God have turned his house from being a house of worship into what he called a den of thieves. Which is to say that the people were mistreating what God had given them. And Jesus, he goes about turning over tables and, and rebuking the people for misusing what he had given them to bring glory to his name. We then get to the end of the second chapter of John and this is what the scripture says in verse number 23 it says because of the miraculous signs that Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration that many people began to trust in Jesus it says but Jesus didn't trust them because he knew all about people somebody say help Lord it's a, I need, need you to catch this. It says, many begin to trust Jesus, but Jesus didn't trust them because he knew all about people. And no one needed to tell him about human nature, for he knew what was in each person's heart. And then we immediately go into John chapter number five, verse number one. It says, and there was a man named Nicodemus. A religious leader who was a Pharisee and after dark one evening he came to speak to Jesus and he said rabbi we all know that God has sent you to teach us your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you and Jesus replied I tell you the truth unless you are born again you cannot see the kingdom of heaven now most of most people, when we read this interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus, and I have taught it on many occasions, we presume that Nicodemus had good intentions. That his desire was to truly know a little bit more about Jesus and Jesus' ministry. But I want to suggest, given what the scripture tells us at the end of the second chapter of John, in addition to how Jesus responds to Nicodemus' words, that Nicodemus didn't really have good intention. I think Nicodemus was operating out of a sense of offense. Now, now follow me here. He says, Rabbi, right? And so he, he offers an honorific. He gives Jesus a name of honor. He says, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make it and your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. And notice how Jesus responds. He, he does not even acknowledge what we think is a courteous interaction from Nicodemus to Jesus. Jesus goes straight to the point. He says, listen, I'm telling you the truth. Unless you are born again, you're not going to see heaven. Now, why does Jesus respond like this? I believe it was because Jesus knew that Nicodemus' intentions were not pure. Nicodemus heard about if he wasn't at the temple to see how Jesus tore the temple up because of how the people were behaving. The religious leaders, the, the, the Pharisees were offended that Jesus, who is this, this, this son of a carpenter who would come in and tell us how we ought to be operating in the temple? How long have you been saved? How dare you 
question how we relate to God. Jesus is picking up on what Jeremiah addresses in the 17th chapter of Jeremiah. In the ninth verse, Jeremiah says it like this. He says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and is not just wicked but desperately wicked and who really knows how bad the heart is Jesus was picking up on that same thing and 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 the writer in the second chapter towards the end of John's gospel, he, he starts naming the same thing. Jesus wasn't trusting people just because of how they talked. Because people will put up good talking games all the time. But there's a difference between what is coming out of your mouth and what is bound up in your heart. And I think there is something for us to, to, to interrogate there even in our own lives. We started out talking about this idea of fits and the bait of offense. What's interesting about offense is you may be offended, but you may not give um, the notion of your offense to the person that has offended you. You may just be carrying it around in your heart. And you are believing that they should know how they offended you. And therefore should have taken corrective action already to address the offense. But the reality is, is that no one is a mind reader. And because most of us want people to assume that we know what's in their mind, we don't say what we really mean. So, let me keep going with this text because we need to get down to verse number 14. Jesus says in verse 3, John chapter number 3, he says, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Amen. Nicodemus says, well, what do you mean? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of spirit. You need to be baptized in Jesus' name and you need to receive the infilling gift of the Holy Ghost. Jesus says humans can't reproduce. I'm sorry, humans can reproduce human life, but it is the Holy Spirit that gives spiritual life. And because of this, you ought not be surprised when I say to you that you must be born again. Right. See, Nicodemus, you've been living, but you've been living your natural life. And you, you've not even begun the beginning of your spiritual life. Yet you are leading people as if you are spiritual. Somebody say, help Lord. And there is that tendency for people to want to lead other people spiritually yeah. without having first been born again. Amen. And I'm grateful for the old church who used to tell us, you need the Holy Ghost. Amen. You need to repent of your sins. You need to be baptized. You need the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Because it left no no wondering of whether or not I would be in right standing with God until I got the Holy Ghost. What I want to say to you, two points and we're going to move. The first point is that people will, they'll always try to hide being offended by your words. But their actions will always tell the true story. Stop, by, stop going by what people say. Because people will tell you they love you, they care for you, they care about you, but treat you like trash in just a few moments. And the natural tendency will be for you to be offended because they treated you like trash. 
but you better stay away from the bait. And I believe the Lord is trying to get us to understand that we ought not to be so easily moved by what we see. It takes a discerning eye to understand what is really going on. We need discernment. And the, and the, and the old time church used to understand the importance of discernment. Because a discerning spirit will cut through what you're saying. That's right. And they don't even have to give you a clue that they know what's really going on beneath the surface. But what discerning does, it, it allows us not to be moved by your words. By, by what is being revealed instead behind the scenes by the Spirit of God. I'm, I'm talking about this idea that it may not make sense what God is doing, mm -hmm. but we need to let God be God. Yeah. Now, Scripture goes on. This interaction continues between Jesus and, and Nicodemus. Jesus makes his point. Nicodemus, not only you, but every person must be born of water. They need to be baptized in Jesus' name, yeah. and they need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Yeah. Jesus says to Nicodemus in, in verse number 10, he says, you are a respected teacher. He's talking to Nicodemus. And yet you don't understand what it is that I'm telling you. How is that possible? And he says, I assure you, we tell you what we know and what we've seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me, when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe when I tell you about heavenly things and then we get to verse number 14 which is where we started and this is where I want to make my point and us get out of here it says in verse number 14 it says and as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on the pole in the wilderness so the son of man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life this is Jesus he's still talking to Nicodemus this is still Jesus who's having a conversation with Nicodemus in the context of Jesus not trusting the people around him because Jesus is discerning of people's hearts. And Jesus makes this reference to an Old Testament encounter where Moses lifted up a bronze, surf, a, a bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness. And it was the lifting up of the snake on the pole that actually saved the people of Israel. Yeah. We need to look at it to understand the context of what Jesus is really talking about. So go in your Bibles with me just for a few moments to know the book of Numbers. The 21st chapter. And we're going to start our reading at verse number 4. Numbers, the 21st chapter. We're almost, we're almost done. Beginning our reading at verse number four. It says, Then the people of Israel set out from Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient with the long journey, and they began to speak against God and Moses why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness they complained there is nothing to eat here and there is nothing to drink and we hate this horrible manna remember we're still talking about offense right the Lord has freed the people of Israel from Egyptian captivity and he's taken them across the Red Sea on dry ground, a miraculous event, no doubt. And God, even in the wilderness, provided for the children of Israel water when they got thirsty. He provided food for them by way of manna when they got hungry. And even when they got tired of manna, God sent them quail to feed them. God showed up 
at every moment when they needed him. Somebody say it may not make sense. But let God be God. Yes, on the one hand, he brought them into the wilderness. But he said, I'm not going to bring you here to die. I'm going to sustain you until I get you to the place that I prepared for you. And all you have to do is trust me when you can't understand me. But the people of Israel could not trust God because they were offended. Lord, how dare you bring us into this wilderness and not give us a glimpse of where it is that we are going and not give us some of the amenities that we'll have in the place that you promised for us while we are in the middle of transition. I need to say that one again. They were offended at God because it was more difficult than they felt like it should be. Even though the place of comfort was coming. And for some of us, under the sound of my voice, we have become offended at God and at God's people. And consequently, can't stop complaining about not only what's wrong with God's people and not only about what's wrong with the church but also with why is it God that you have brought me to this place and surely there are other people who have done worse things and deserve worse off than me somebody say help Lord the children of Israel were a complaining people here is my question for you are you a complainer or are you a praiser? I'm going to ask it again. Are you a complainer or are you a praiser? I love it that, that the Lord has, has ordained me to be a praiser. And I don't care what's going on around me. I can find a way to lift up a hallelujah. Hey, even when there's no money in the bank account, I can give the Lord a I praise you. Lord, my body may be weak right now, but you still get the glory. Are you a complainer or are you a praiser? Because when you're a praiser, you just praise. <laughs> at, at any time but when you're a praiser you praise for surely when it's time to praise some people say well if the choir would sing a little different then we, we could praise a little more but then you're not a praiser you're a part time praiser and the Lord is not looking for any part time praisers as a matter of fact the Lord says I'm looking for those that are going to worship me in spirit and in truth true praise emerges out of the goodness of God not out of your circumstance and I would to God that the people of God would, would put down this idea of being complainers and lift up the banner of praise Confuse the enemy. He's wondering why are you praising when things are going wrong in your life? Because I picked up the banner of praise. Good God Almighty. Children of Israel were a group of complainers. They weren't satisfied when the Lord provided water out of the rock. They weren't satisfied when the Lord sent manna from heaven manna this which literally meant what is this Lord I don't know what it is but it has been sustaining me and for so many of you 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 are at a place where God has sent you manna you don't know how he's sustaining you but he's doing it Lord what is this it's, it's just the Lord's manna it's sustaining you the children of Israel complained rather than gave thanks 
they were thankful initially. But after they had to start living off manna for a few weeks and a, and a few months, their thanksgiving turned into complaining. You may be driving a 2008, but you better be thankful for your 2008. Whatever it is. Ford, Kia, uh, Bids, I don't care what it is. If it is getting you from point A to point B, you better stop trying to match yourself up to another person's vehicle and give God. Somebody say, pick up the banner of praise. Pick up the banner of praise. They weren't satisfied with the, with the manna, so the Lord sends quail. You don't like these wafers, I'll give you meat. The Lord gave them so much meat that they, they were tired of the meat. What's the point? People love to complain. Or said differently, they were offended at God for bringing them out into this wilderness place and providing for them in a way other than the way they wanted him to provide. Somebody say help, Lord. You are, you just a praise away <laughs> from the next miracle in your life. But you just need to, you need to ask God to help you get, a, get free from this bait of offense that has you stuck in complaint and is holding you back from lifting up the banner of praise. Now, it says that they complained in verse number 5. I'm, in, I'm still in uh, Numbers, the 21st chapter. It says, they said, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? They complained. There's nothing to eat here, and there's nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible manner. You better stop. <laughs> you better stop hating that which God is using to sustain you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Help, Lord. Jesus, help us. <laughs> Thank you. you better stop hating and despising the things that God is using in your life right now to sustain you and prepare you for your next level in Him. Thank you, Lord. Help me, Holy Ghost. It says, and so the Lord. Because they called the manna that he sent horrible. In verse number 6 it says, So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people. And many were bitten and died. Um, the bait of offense can cause you to die before your time. God had placed them in the wilderness and was providing them with what they needed to live until they made it to their land of promise. But because they were offended at how God was working in their life, God sent snakes that were poisonous and many of the people of Israel died in the place that was designed to sustain them. It says the people, they were bitten and many died. And then the people came to Moses and they cried out, We've sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord would take away the snakes. And I haven't even said anything about how in our offense, uh, we oftentimes direct our anger at leaders. Right, so the, the leaders become... Um, the, 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 the people and the, and the things that get the brunt of our anger yes, yes, yes. even though where it is that God has you is really God's doing yes. but once the Lord sent these poisonous snakes the people 
change their minds about the leaders. And they began to ask Moses, listen, would you just talk to the Lord on my behalf? I know I've been talking crazy to you for the last year and a half, but would you ignore that and pray that the Lord would send relief? And it says that Moses prayed for the people. It says in verse number 8, And then the Lord told Moses, He said, Make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole. And all who are bitten will live if they simply look at this snake that's on the pole. And so Moses made a snake out of, a, 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 out of bronze and he attached it to the pole and then anyone who was bitten by a snake could look at this bronze snake and was healed. This is what Jesus is speaking of when he's talking to Nicodemus. There are some passages of scripture that are straightforward to me but there are other passages of scripture that are not. And this, both this Numbers 21 text and um, the John text where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he refers to Moses lifting up the serpent on the pole and people being healed as a result it has oftentimes confounded me because essentially it sounds almost like the Lord told Moses to create an idol and to put an idol on a pole and then call God's people who God has told to never look at or worship a graven image to now look at this idol on a pole. God, what are you doing? Somebody say it may not make sense. But you better let God be God. We know in the, we know in the Ten Commandments we know in the Mosaic Law, the Lord forbids them for creating these, these, these images and, and, and people looking to them as a source. Yet God instructs Moses to create an image, hold it up to the people, tell the people if you are, if you're sick, if you've been bitten, if you've been poisoned, look to this image and you will be healed. They, Moses followed the Lord's instruction and for all those who had been bitten that had not yet died if they looked to this serpent this, this snake on the pole they were healed now this is what I want to say to you is that I believe what the scripture is telling us is that when God sends us manna from heaven when God sends us provision from heaven when we reject it and start complaining about it and becoming offended at what God is giving us that God will instead use something that is offensive to humble us and bring us back to a place of humility that we might get healed because God is not going to heal you in your arrogance. And he won't heal you until you humble yourself. God provides for us. And when we are not thankful for what he has provided and instead begin to complain and get caught in the trap of offense. God will then use something that is offensive and you will have to work your way through your offense yes. to get healed. Yes. Wow. And so right now, there's a word that, some, that, that the Lord has placed in someone's mouth for you. It could be a word of direction for your next business opportunity. It could be a word of, of, of direction for your next um, promotion, 
right? It could be a word for your next elevation spiritually, but the word is going to be in someone's mouth that you can't stand. And unless you get over the offense, you will die in the wilderness. It may not make sense. Why do we have to repent of our sins? Why do we have to be baptized in the water in Jesus' name? Why do we have to um, look for this promised gift of the Holy Ghost? God, can't you do it another way? He could. But this is the way that he's chosen. And there's many who have not yet come to the Lord because they are offended about the idea of having to repent of their sins. Yes. That's, that's true. Well, we're all sinners. We done all messed up. Why I got to repent? Lord, many people have talked crazy. Why, why do I have to be the one to, 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 to change the way I talk to others? Here is the question. Do you want to be free? Do you want to be whole? The Lord is saying to Nicodemus, I know that you are a leader in the temple and amongst God's people. But just because you are a leader doesn't mean that your heart has been properly postured toward me. Because this, this call to humility is a call for everyone. I don't care where you are in the church. Right. Yeah. I don't care even if you're not in the church. Come on. Right? The, and many of the people who are not in church are not in church because they've been offended by something or someone yeah. in the church. Right. But if you're going to come to Jesus, yeah. you're going to have to be delivered from your offense. And this is really what Jesus is getting at. Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, just like in the Old Testament when the, the children of Israel were offended by my provision and by my acts, if you want to see my hand manifest in your life, you're going to need to be free from offense. Because the people found the Lord's provision detestable. The Lord transformed a symbol of death into a source of life and deliverance. The rejection of God's grace brought a symbol of death. But the intervention of God's grace brought life. And Jesus is saying to every person under the sound of my voice, I know you are at a place that you can't quite understand. I know that there are people who represent me that have offended you. But I have come that you might have life and that more abundantly. And my desire is to see you free from the spirit of offense. That you might walk in a freedom that you've never experienced before. So that things that used to bother you, they don't bother you anymore. Hallelujah. Somebody will be able to, to, to take on a new testimony that says, I am free. I am free indeed. I'm no longer bound by the chains that have, that have been holding me. People, the way that they've been treating me and the way I, I think that they perceive me, I'm free from the, the thoughts of other people. So that I am most concerned about how God thinks about me. 
This, I'm done. This, this idea of the Lord telling Moses to put a snake on a stick and hold it up to God's people. And that be the thing that the Lord uses to heal and set free God's people. It is hard for me to, to get my mind around it. But that is the nature of faith. That God will oftentimes call us to do things that don't make sense. But if you can just get past the hump of what sounds like something that is crazy if God is telling you to do it. You will open up the door to blessings that are yet to be told. Talking about spiritual renewal and, and, and the, the, the movement of the Holy Ghost in the, in the lives and in the, in the hearts of God's people. Families being saved. Communities being transformed. All the, all, all the result of being free from offense. So that we're able to be humble. Would you stand on your feet? God is moving in an unusual way. God is, he is, he's reshaping us and he's resetting us. And for, for many of us, we don't really understand God. You've not done it like this before. And to be honest, Lord, I don't like it is what you're doing and how you're doing it. But I believe the, word, the Lord brought me here on this morning to say to you, reject the spirit of offense because of the path that God has brought you on. Because if you reject that spirit of offense, you will find newfound freedom some of, some, of, some of you, your, your praise has been locked up. And it, and it, it needs to get out. But, but it needs to go through, the, through the, 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 the tunnel of humility. And repentance saying, God, I'm sorry for all the ways I've doubted you. Lord, all the ways that I've questioned you because I couldn't see you at work. If you will make your way through that tunnel you would see freedom in Jesus in a way that you've never experienced it before. I don't know why God is doing what he's doing, but I know he's doing it. I know he's opening doors, even right now. Because I am trusting him when I don't understand it. Lord, I'm going to do your will, even though it doesn't make sense to me. Lord, I'm going to love your people even though they act unlovable. Lord, I'm going to do your will even when I don't understand it. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. The Lord is doing it. And he's looking for someone to say, Lord, that was me. I was bound by offense. I was stuck on the trap of offense. But today is the day that I will be free. Today is the day that I will, I will humble myself before you, God. Because I'm tired of being in the same place. And I want what you have in store for me. Hallelujah! Oh God, we praise you. If that's you, you need to make your way to the altar right now. There's freedom. There is, there is deliverance. There is, there is breakthrough. There is salvation.